in search for truth. Expectations and shoulds. Expectations and shoulds are what easily form a cage for our true self and relationship to an understanding of the world. As American poet and philosopher, Albert Hubbard said, our desires always disappoint us. For though we meet with something that gives us satisfaction, yet it never thoroughly answers expectation. In reality, from childhood, we form expectations of ourselves, others, and the world in general. It is self-involved and mostly unrealistic. But we cling to them as perception of our own identity and as value. It assumes a clear boundary between the self and our control over the environment. Alas, it is but an illusion we desperately cling to as we believe it defines our value. The unrealistic demands is like an inner slave driver. One can never succeed that way. It just forms an endless cycle of disappointment and dissatisfaction. Therefore, expectation is not just an illusion that forever remains just out of our grasp. The resulting continuous dissatisfaction, disappointment affects our thoughts and feelings, which easily becomes habitual, habitually negative and hopeless. Expectation is not only the opposite of patience, but acceptance as well. Expectations about not accepting ourselves who we are and always living in another moment present. Every person in this world, no matter what his or her role in life, is a search for truth. Scholars delving into the path, scientists seeking to explain the universe, the atom, the butterfly, neighbors conversing over the back fence. Each of us in every daily situation endeavors to see things as they truly are. Plato and Aristotle, two great philosophers, were in pursuit of philosophical truth, according to Blackburn, 1996. Plato believed that one should use his mind, intellect, reason in search of truth, knowledge, and ultimate reality. In Plato's search of truth, he viewed the body as a hindrance, an obstacle in this search, and one that must be struggled against by the soul at all times. It plagues the mind with all sorts of desires and appetites, barely giving the mind time to think. So it is the job of man to remove himself as entirely as he can from his body, to use it only in the barest, simplest fashion, only to survive. Without the body being an obstacle, truth was easier for Plato to search for. Aristotle believed that although any discipline study is promising because there is ultimate truth to be discovered, the abstractness of metaphysical reasoning requires that we think about the process we are employing, even as we use them in search of the truth. Aristotle believed that there was a truth to be found, and he went about it by observing what he and other people in life do. As always, Aristotle assumed that the structure of language and logic naturally mirrors the way things really are. Even though Plato and Aristotle had a different way of going about things, they both were still were in hot pursuit of the truth. Friedrich Nietzsche believed the search of truth or the will to truth was a consequence of the will to power philosophers. He thought that the truth should be used as long as it promoted life and the will to power. And he thought untruth was better than truth. If it had this life enhancement as a consequence. As he wrote in Beyond Good and Evil, the falseness of the judgment is to us not necessarily an objection to a judgment. The question is, to what extent it is life advancing, life preserving, species preserving, perhaps even species breeding. He proposed the will to power as a truth only because according to him, it was the most life affirming and sincere perspective one could have. Robert Wicks discusses um, Nietzsche's basic, of basic view of truth as follows. Some scholars regard Nietzsche's 1873 unpublished essay on truth and lies in an unmoral sense as a keystone in his thought. 
In this essay, Nietzsche rejects the idea of a universal constant and claims that the cold truth is only a mobile metaphor, metonyms, and, and for Paul Fums, his view at the time is that arbitrariness completely prevails within human experiences, concepts originate via the very artistic transference of no stimuli into images. The truth is nothing more than the invention of a fixed convention for merely practical purpose, especially those of repose, security, and consistency. Weeks, 2008. Why this insistence, urge for truth? It seems to be an integral part of us, a nostalgia in the whole, a longing for more moral, real comprehension, a hunger that nothing less than what is true will satisfy. What does this imply? That we seek to know the state of affairs in our neighbourhood, our nation, the world. We are also concerned with what is happening ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically. Why does one fall ill? What are the causes of disease? What are germs, bacteria, viruses? Is the world similarly affected? Do we, human viruses, have the power to poison our globe? This is a worry to many people. Can the earth get sick? If so, it must be more than a lump, the lump of mass that we have been led to believe it is. All these questions illustrate our abiding concern with the truth and our search for truth goes hand in hand, our ability to comprehend it. Everyone has a truth. Everyone has a kind of longing to know how things really are. The quest for truth is not an intellectual gain. It is looking within and spark in looking within and looking without. Nothing we see outside would mean anything unless it sparks something within us. How we know beauty, grandeur, courage, unless these qualities are within us to respond. In sense, truth lives in us, divine potential. We can only conclude that the truth resides in the heart of all heart of all beings, great and small. Some have unfolded more understanding of truth. We are at the human stage of comprehension and self-expression. Birds are birds by reason of the same process. Gods are gods because they have unfolded into God-like. Hence, truth-seeking has throughout the ages been linked to the idea of a path, path of unfolding latent capacities. We're on this path leading to our flowering as human beings, whether or not we realise it. And we extend our view to encompass many lives or reincarnations, we realize that we have time, the time scale needed for everyone to develop his or her high potential. Those who have successfully accomplished this are great teachers and among philosophers, Christ, Buddha, Sarista, and a host of others among them, Plato, Pythagoras. Truth needs no outside force for it persuades by its innate veracity. What kind of truth are we looking for, religious, philosophic, or scientific? It is sometimes believed that these three are incompatible. This is not the case, however. For they are facets of one truth in man, in nature, into the cosmos. One may approach reality from spiritual point of view, other than intellectual, a third from observing the physical world with all its marvels and beauty. They could not more contradict one another with the fact that. I am a soul contradicts that I also have a body. Properly understood, the wisdom of each branch of learning can only augment and extend the others or each approach the same reality from a different angle. The great universe surrounds us on every side. It is our parent we're born of and from it. All of that we are in the small, it must be on an immensely grander scale. We have only to step outside some night when the wise old stars are shining, looking up into the immeasurable heavens, something stirs within us, a feeling beyond the reaches of finite mind. The soul yearns for an immensity it cannot grasp, for a deep calling to deep. According to old traditions, a universal parent has a certain structure and operates in certain ways. It was born as we were born, lives its life, and like us, one day it will die, rest, and sometime in the far, far future, 
it will be reborn. Religion, science, philosophy seek to explain it and their relation to it. They search for truth of it, approaching the problem from their respective points of view using their own terms. There can be no final statement to the truth to the degree that individual penetrates the mystery and reports his findings honestly. To that degree, will his conclusions coincide with the equally honest findings of others, whether these be metaphysical or physical. But when the spirit of free inquiry has fled an organization designed to house it, what is left are the empty ceremonial, sterile, cerebral platitudes, persecution, as he stands in the wings. We all learners, one another, and we hold, we, and we would learn very little if we consulted only those who hold our point of view. One, often more is to be gleaned from those whose thoughts differ from ours. But sometimes the barrier of semantics separates those whose beliefs actually may be very close. If one were to search for similarities rather than differences, he would find agreement in the broad area of general principles. What is the difference between the karma of the East and the sowing and reaping of the New Testament? There is no reason we must have unanimity of opinion. Truth is one, it cannot be otherwise. The past two are numerous as our researchers. What this means is that all efforts through the ages to explain the cosmos are based indeed, must be based on certain principles and experiences common to all, including the mystical and poetical. The way to keep the truth alive and growing in our hearts is to re-express it constantly, otherwise, we shall become worshippers of commas and semicolon, and truth will rely in unthinking mantras endlessly repeated. In a long search of moving centuries, the living spirit of the truth becomes entombed in its very institutions. Dogmas grow in the minds of men. Once symbols of the living message, they sooner or later become like shells found on a lonely beach, often beautiful, but a structure from which the life and meaning have fled. The answer to our search does not lie in institutions, it lies in ourselves. The spirit of the most high is in all things, in the wind moving against our faces, in the sparrow and daisy and the pebble, in those who suffer and those who are glad, in the beautiful and the ugly, and in the ugly made beautiful by the spirit wind within. The wisest of mankind have pictured man as a child of the cosmos. They saw the worlds that bestrew the fields of space as animated by cosmic divinities in whom we live and move and have our being that life animates. Universes breathe in us also, and that we too are the beneficiaries of its serene laws. The truth is out there and in here, is the way things are in us and in our world. We are urged to search for it by forces within ourselves, soul qualities. How much will come to us through suffering? How much through joyful realization? How much in the day to day giving of our best known? best to calls of duty, how much for our love or companions known and unknown who travel the road of life with us.